morning. Abadi Zasbui. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, today we'll be having a um, couple of panel discussions. Swahili Society America, in collaboration with the Prince George's Census Complete County Committee, we'll be presenting an education seminar. So, our first panel discussion will be about Swahili culture and censors. We have Dr. Leonard Mwaka. Dr. Leonard Mwaka, may you come over. Dr. Mwaka is a linguist professor at Howard University. We have Dr. Nichols Boas, our dad, our father, and the only one. May you come over, bro. <laughs> Dr. Boas is a professor at University of District of Columbia. We have Ms. Nema Orari. She's a mental health professional at Adventist Behavior Health. And before we proceed, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Elvis Dana, a representative from African diaspora Reason Office of the Prince George's County Executive. Thank you, Mr. Alves, for coming. And also, I would like to acknowledge Ms. John Oport, the co-founder and CEO of African for Mental Health and a representative from <laughs> Governor's <laughs> County. So, Ms. John Oport, she's Kenyan. She works at that great office. So we have people from the governor's count, PG count, so we're gonna have a great time, great knowledge. We come here to learn, network. And most of all, we have to understand the importance of sensors. As we know, sensor only happens once in 10 years. So it's very important we understand and we listen to uh, Mr. Elvis Dana, who will be accompanied with uh, Thomas F. Johnson, too. He's from Office of Community Relations Census 2020 Project Lead. So, the first panel. Welcome, guys. Okay. Um, uh, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Habari um, Zasbui. Naza Jiji Hilila. Washington kwa ujumla safi kabisa. Kwa hivyo kama mlivoelezwa jina langu ni Leonard Mwaka. Um, ninafundisha Kiswahili na isimu katika chuo kikuu cha Howard. Um, nafikiri labda lugha ya kutumiwa ni Kiingereza eh? Yeah, safi kabisa. Okay. Nitachanganya basi nimeambiwa ni 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 tu ni tu mile tunaita code switching. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is basically to speak as a linguist because this is what I know and this is what I've trained, uh, I've, I've been trained to do. Um, Swahili language is one of the many languages that we have in this world. We have about 6,000 languages. Of course, Swahili comes from Africa and by virtue of that, you're talking about about 2,035 uh, 2, languages in Africa. Swahili falls within the group of what we call the Bantu languages. We have about 500 of these languages spreading all the way from uh, Cameroon all the way to South Africa. However, within this larger family, we also find ourselves within a region that has to operate <coughs> with languages of wider communication. Swahili therefore becomes that central and important uh, point of convergence for East and Central Africa. 
coming to that level, you're going to find that Swahili has over 120 million speakers. So the idea of census is actually very important because we get to know what languages are we using. We may have p speakers who have more than one language, uh, which is a very common phenomenon in Africa. So multilingualism is what we know thrives in Africa. When you come to the U.S., if you are one of the people who came here voluntarily, you'll see that you have uh, more than one language. But the critical point is Swahili has played a critical role even during um, liberation movements. You look at Tanzania, for example, Swahili is what actually promoted the Ujamaa ideology. And without Swahili, I don't think Ujamaa would have thrived. So when we see that, and when we go back, you look at the 1905, if you remember your history, we had what we called the Maji Maji Rebellion. So the belief that if we unite under one language, we can actually create a very uh, powerful and strong defense system worked for uh, the Tanzanians who are fighting the Germans. And because of that, even though it was a belief in something that was quite different, you see that uh, Kinja Ketile was able to convince different people that if you're one, you're going to win. So Swahili becomes a critical tool, not only as a resource, but also as something that has um, what we call identity. So your language and identity becomes critical. Uh, we know, as I said already, that we speak so many languages. But because of Swahili, it doesn't matter where you come. You may come from Congo, you may come from Tanzania, you may come from Kenya, you may come from Uganda, wherever Swahili is spoken. But the moment you're here, you realize that this other person is like you. And in a lot of ways, this is why um, scholars like um, uh, Maulana Karenga from uh, California, an African-American, was able to use Swahili to mobilize other people who then believed in what we now call Kwanzaa. The ideals and the tenets of that particular ideology do use Swahili terminology. And therefore, it has become a powerful tool, especially, as I said, how do we identify ourselves? Having come here many years ago, African Americans try to find a, who are we? And one of the ways we can do this is by using Swahili to really unite us. Very recently, you've seen a lot of um, uh, calls for Swahili to be used within the continent of Africa. A lot of people are using it. South Africa, uh, Ghana, in fact, one of my students who is in Ghana tells me they have about 700 students studying Swahili in Ghana. Now, what does that tell you? Uh, it tells you there's so many people who want to study Swahili. And just yesterday again, I was talking to somebody who says they want a Swahili instructor to help them teach on a voluntary basis Swahili within the DC area. These are very critical uh, points, and this is a critical time for Swahili because not only is the East African uh, region advocating for Swahili, but the entire continent is doing so. And beyond the continent, we are some, some of us are here in the US because of Swahili. In the US, there will be over 100 institutions that teach Swahili. It is the thriving, um, <clears throat> yeah, it is the thriving language that actually, the mm. thriving African language that is taught. Let me speak about Howard. Howard has a very strong Swahili program, for example. Um, it is uh, in the Department of World Languages, uh, which I chair, you'll find that Swahili will be the third um, most important language in terms of enrollment. Uh, what does that mean? It means, therefore, we have funding that comes from the federal government, the university has to hire more people, and we get to have students who will go to East Africa to continue I improving their proficiency in the language. What does that do to the economy of East Africa? It improves that economy. Because if we have, for example, Fulbright taking 15 students from across the nation, and each is paying about a, roughly an average of um, 8000 uh, dollars. So eight times 15, I leave it to the mathematicians, you'll see that there's a lot of money that goes in directly. And then when the students go there, they will be buying things from local um, you know, uh, traders, they will be traveling to other places, they improve the economy of our countries. There will be also another group that will come maybe from Princeton, from another university. All of this adds to what 
is going to improve our economy. So that is something we hardly talk about. When we talk about tourism, we are only thinking of who are these people coming. We forget that they are students who are learning this language, and someday they are the ones who are going to take the language. So uh, my uh, plea to uh, those of us who know Swahili and who can speak Swahili, it is that we should, in fact, begin with our heritage learners. These are the young kids who are born here, and uh, they're going to be speaking this language, and someday it will give them uh, a place in terms of their career, but they're also going to influence policies on how African, lang African countries view our African languages. Incidentally, we tend to belittle our languages. We always think of French, we think of uh, Spanish, we think of uh, these other languages, which is an ideology of privileging those languages and forgetting that our own language is a powerful tool. Um, I think some of you know, if you studied Swahili, you know of somebody called Shaban Robert. Yeah. <laughs> he said a very powerful tool, um, you know, phrase that uh, <coughs> Titi la mama uh, litamu japo I'm just paraphrasing that. That means even though you may uh, belittle your own, it is still the one thing that you go back to no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. So for me, in terms of culture, we have to remember that, that Swahili is in itself carrying the culture of many other cultures of African region. Why? Because Swahili has borrowed from these other languages. These other languages have enriched Swahili. There has always been this wrong impression that Swahili is a mixed language, that it is uh, uh, an offshoot of Arabic. That's a very wrong impression, and if you have anybody who thinks so, please correct them, tell them no. Swahili is a uh, Bantu language. It has borrowed, like English has borrowed from Latin, from French, from uh, Greek, whatever it is. That is how we should look at Swahili. It borrowed because there was influence from these other cultures in terms of writing. And because of that, in fact, if you didn't know, we began writing in Swahili using the Arabic script. And that didn't mean that therefore Swahili was Arabic. No, it is just the script. And many languages did that, including Hausa, including these other languages that were influenced by Islamic or by uh, people who came in with the Islamic religion. So we have just to be careful how we present our language. Uh, Swahili therefore becomes a unifying language. No one can claim it is on his own, I mean, we can all say it is our language. But do res, uh, also let us remember that um, then those who will call Swahili as a first language, the native language, they are the people who initially were called the Wangozi from the coastal region of East Africa. And we have about 18 dialects of Swahili, which are, you know, were named because of the cities around there, for, uh, around where this, these people were coming from. But because of that kind of uh, what we call standardization, which took place during the colonialism, we have the standard Swahili. So what we need to do and remember is there are actually speakers who may number about four million. Those are the ones who are born speaking Swahili. The other people will be born bilingual or multilingual, or rather will grow into a community that is multilingual, and then they will acquire this language naturally, and that is important for us. So as we look at what we are doing, I want us to remember that, um, as I mentioned, that Swahili is a language that we should cherish, we should work to promote, because others are going to do so. But working with, um, say, for example, the counties or the government, our embassies, we should be able to put it at par with this other language. It's a critical language, no matter how we look at it. It is a language that we can teach our children the cultures of our people. It is therefore a language I ask all of us to pay attention to, and if there's any resource that we, we can help, including those who are in institutions, those who want to begin heritage uh, language learning classes, let's sit together and define a way to be able to do this in a more progressive manner. Thank you so much. Good morning. I guess I guess we're getting to noon now. It's quarter to twelve. Thank you for coming. And I want to say it's it's a good day when we can meet and interact and try to learn from each other. I think it's a pretty good thing. This is a timely seminar. And when I think about Elvis, I think I talked with you the other time when we were with, with, with um, Libe. Yeah, when I was with Libe in his car, we talked about, about this, this program. And I think 
to a great extent, um, census is part of culture. And th I think you mentioned in, in passing here. And I, I want to tie this, uh, see how these relate. And I probably would say, um, in order for any person to be able to interact effectively, you need to learn about other people, as, uh, other people's culture as you meet. So you can be a little bit sensitive and try to move away from being ethnocentric, which means from being biased. So as we interact, we get to know one another and minimize those differences because that's the key in, in really being an effective um, 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 communicator that you have to embrace and try to listen carefully and understand where they're coming from. And then you may be, res you may be able to respond now in a way that it, it brings meaning and it brings really understanding because you have listened well by paying attention to what is being said and then you're able to respond effectively by addressing what has been said. Now, let me begin now by saying, by really defining here what is culture and then I'll get into cultural diversity here. Um, I do have a handout here that says, uh, for example, culture is the way we do things. How do we do things? Based on the values that have been passed to us by um, relatives, parents, the elders in the community, and through the experience and through the media. So culture does organize us in a way of how then we can um, 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 uh, preserve the, those um, uh, values and beliefs that we think uh, um, identify us who we are. So here, I'll just read this very quickly. Culture is, 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 is that which shapes us, it shapes our identity and influences our behavior. It's a key now. If your behavior is influenced by your culture. We know, for example, those who come from uh, Swahili speaking you know, um, countries, and basically, even the people from like uh, Kenya, Tanzania, whatever, they speak the Swahili. You can see that there are some of the things that within that, within that, uh, within using Kiswahili, we apply some of the cultures of being, for example, polite, okay, of respecting the elders in the community. We do that, even though you would say that traditional Africa does that. But of course, Swahili does depict that, does show that. Um, i give an example, and, and this uh, sometimes I do observe a lot. When you go to, like to, um, and here, here like in America, when you go to an American home, some, something like that, at times kids will not get up the chair to leave that chair for an elder. And you can see that back in, in our African nation, in Swahili countries, Kenya, Uganda, whatever, you go in their homes, the kids will just move quickly and leave that chair for, for an elder. So, does the culture, so that was the cultural value that has been passed there by their parents. So culture shifts our behavior the way we need to interact with the other people. Now, here is a problem. For example, once we, we have to be very careful that we don't want to be ethnocentric, that our culture is the best than any other culture. Because speakingly, truly, is that culture is the best way it is. The American culture is best right here. Okay, Tanzanian culture is best at, in Tanzania. Kenyan culture, Ugandan, Rwanda is the best way it is. There's an element in between there, these, these d different cultures, that because we need to interact, this world is coming very smaller now. We are, we are interacting every day. There's a term that is used in communication that is titled intercultural communication. And simply, that area of study teaches people to be respectful to other cultures. Try to understand how they, they do things, okay? In understanding how they do things, then you are, you're, you're gonna be better in terms of inching and interacting with them. And especially, for example, if you do business, 
America is a country that is, is uh, really business oriented. Within that intercultural communication, these advertisers tend to go to these countries to learn how people interact. How do they do things? They learn some words. They are smart simply because they want to make business. They don't want to go and, of course, um, um, offend people in those countries, offend their cultural values, because they want to get those people to get into the business. Now, I've seen many, many commercials here in America where you have a lot of uh, Swahili words being used, okay? But these are people, these advertisers have gone, must have gone to Kenya or Tanzania, Uganda to learn what they mean. So when they, they take the ad ad advertisement back to those countries, people feel that they are being respected. And for that matter, they may get into buying those items that they bring over there. So Swahili right there is critical, as Mwaka said, in terms of really expanding business. Uh, orientation or whatever um, that, that um, it can be meaningful to both the advertisers and those who live in those countries. So pretty much that's, that's, that I would say that's one of the benefits of, of, of really uh, being able to learn and understand the Swahili culture. And I'll piggyback again to what he said. We need really to teach our, for me, will be our grandchildren here that they know Swahili because it's going to be a plus in their lives, you know. And not only that, because they can be experts in terms of transmitting this knowledge to those who want to learn Kiswahili, those who want to go maybe to these East African countries where they speak Swahili so they're able to interact and, and make sense of what they, what, what's going on. I think that's the key. Now, I know... Uh, Libe has written some of the things like values. Values are good because um, we are based on our values, how, how we, we welcome people in our home, how we speak with, with people from different cultures, whatever. And so that do, does accommodate that in terms of really um, respecting people and, and um, just being, being um, nice to them. There, there are these terms, I'm sorry, I'm going to be, there are these terms that if you study Language, because I'll tell you what, language is, is culture and culture's language. Okay, language is communication and communication is language. Because all this revolves around the values and the beliefs. I come from, um, uh, I, I'm, my, I'm my, an expert in, um, well, that's what I studied anyway, communication and media and politics. I came out of Howard. And uh, it's a great platform there when you really go to see how these languages, and they, as you say, they teach a lot of language in those schools. And a lot of universities in America do teach Kiswahili and other languages, I know that. Why? Because, simple again, that's part of how to ease that interaction where people don't have to be biased, ethnocentric, like my culture is the best than yours. Okay, right now, all of us here who, are come, who come from, um, from different countries here, okay, there's a dominant culture here. That's Anglo-Saxon, that's English culture. I mean, I mean we, the language and all these things, it's a dominant culture. So we have to follow the dominant culture even though we are from other countries, um, for us to interact effectively with the people who live here, we have to learn how they do things. We, we, there, there, there's no way. We have to learn and be able to interact effectively, whether we are in class or whether we are doing business or we are socializing. You have to recognize that dominant culture. But that does not mean you have to discard your culture. No. You are right there in, in, the, in, the, um, in the forefront there, embracing the American culture. Anglo-Saxon, English culture, whatever. But as we go home or we meet in our communities like this, we, what do we do? We speak Swahili. We preserve our identity because you don't want to lose your identity. All right? You're Kenya and everybody. Yeah. Got to remember that. So the culture, in a way, then, 
helps us as we get into this intercultural communication to be sensitive and be aware. There are people from different cultures. And it doesn't mean the dominant English culture is best than, than your Kenyan culture or Tanzanian culture. No. No. It's just, just you, you're going to want to feel good and feel that I'm great because I'm, I'm speaking English, but English is not the language of all over the world that, that, that people speak. I mean, I mean that, that's not their traditional language. They have different so, so we have to learn this and be um, um, careful because we know those who are, um, tend to discrimi discriminate people tend to use the language. They, they don't know how to speak English, whatever. So, so what if I don't know how to speak Eng English? Does it um, demean who I am? You know, so those kind of elements, they tend to be discriminatory, uh, need to be um, really uh, avoided. So we need to go and, and um, really embrace cultural values and, and, that, and where now the cultural diversity fits in there, where then people can interact, get to know one another, and that's cultural diversity. Well, how can you work together? So there are a lot of benefits. These from different countries bring knowledge, bring skills, you know. So I think it's a plus thing to have these, these um, to learn about this cultural diversity that can really uh, enhance our being here um, as, as the people. Thank you very much. Well, um, <laughs> it's going to be hard to follow after um, Dr. Mwaka and Dr. Boaz, but I'll give it a shot here. <laughs> um, as was mentioned earlier, um, uh, I uh, have a background in uh, mental health, and I'd like to take some time um, to talk a little bit about um, about mental health. Um, as as some of you may know, or you know, have experienced. Coming from East African culture, coming from Africa overall, uh, mental health is something that we do not give priority to. Um, uh, you know, there's there are a lot of um, thoughts and 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 beliefs that uh, mental health issues or mental health illness um, are are illnesses that are primarily in the Western world, right? That, that people in Africa don't experience mental health. Um, but I I've, have come to, found, to find um, great interest in uh, mental health and, and, and in realizing um, that it's something that as a, a people, as a culture, as a continent, it's something that we need to, that we need to pay attention to for, for many, many reasons. Um, Research has shown um, over the, the past few years um, that uh, uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, meaning mental health disorders, are, um, are they form about 19% of the global um, disease burden. Um, and so when you think of in the entire world, how many, how many people are, you know, the, sick, the sicknesses and the diseases that are in the world, um, 19% of that, of the people that are, you know, of, of all those diseases are formulated by psychiatric diseases and mental health illnesses. Um, and that is a huge number um, for, especially when you consider that, you know, our whole continent, you know, goes without acknowledging uh, mental health or psychiatric illnesses. Um, and so this is something that, you know, over the years, um, it's becoming, as you probably have, you know, are becoming more aware that People are hearing a little bit more about it, but it's definitely something that we are very far behind as a as a continent and as individual countries. Um, you know that speak Swahili, right? Tanzania, uh, Kenya, Uganda. You know all the Eastern Eastern African countries and all the other additional countries: Congo, Ethiopia, um, South Africa. All these other countries that speak Swahili. Um, and for example, depression alone is expected to rise um, um, from fourth um, to second leading cause of global disease burden. So in, in when, you, when you consider how many things or how many diseases or um, you know, illnesses, um, depression itself is, is, is a huge part of that. And it's also one of the uh, uh, leading causes of death um, because people end up you know, becoming um, suicidal and then you know end up going go, because of lack of support lack of resources they end up committing suicide um 
And there are a lot of reasons why Sisi Kama. So I'm going to switch languages because I think all of us has been speaking English. <laughs> so, um, so pardon me if I, you know, mix it up a little bit. Um, lakini um, kuna sababu nyingi sana ambazo zinatusababisha sisi kama wa Afrika kutokuweza kuangalia uh, magonjwa ya kisaikolojia na angalia, kuangalia um, uh, you know, mental health katika uh, kwa undani zaidi um, and some of those uh, some of those reasons in, in, a, in a, moja is, some of those <laughs> sababu sababu hizo ni um, uh, just kuwa na, na ignorance um, kuhusu how much um what to wanna 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 experience magonjwa ya 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 kiakili ya kisaikolojia tunadhani kwamba ni vitu ambavyo viko mbali sana lakini mimi for example um wakati nakuwa uh, nilikuwa pamoja na kwamba nilikuwa you know niko ni mtoto wa kawaida tu you know nilikuwa nimekulia Dar es Salaam nime nimeishi you know na familia yangu nzima um so uh, n- n- wazazi wetu wameangaika wame wanafanya kazi kwa bidii kutusomesha na nini lakini ni vitu ambavyo nilikuwa naviona katika uh, wenzangu wakati tuko shuleni you know, na wenzangu ambao labda wamepitia matatizo mbalimbali wazazi wamefariki labda au wame, wamepata ajali kitu kimewatokea wanapitia depression au wanapitia hii huu msongamano wa, wa mawazo lakini hawana hawapati msaada wa aina yoyote um, kwa hiyo unakuta watu tu tuna, tunateseka ndani um, bila bila kujua na bila kuelewa kwamba kwanza tunavyopitia ni vitu vya kawaida na ni kitu ambacho tungeweza kupata msaada tungeweza kupata uh, uh, mtu ambaye anaweza kutusikiliza um, huku huku Marekani of course um, hata nchi nyingine tu not just Marekani lakini in the western world specifically um, wame, wameweka resources nyingi sana ambazo watu wanaweza kupata ili kuweza kupata msaada wakipitiwa waki, waki na hayo matatizo lakini kule kwetu hivyo vitu havipo kwa hiyo unakuta watu wanapitia tu hizo shida na kwa sababu culture yetu inajaribu ina, ina, ina kueleza uh, kwa nini unapitia hivyo vitu wanasema oh labda wewe una nguvu labda wewe ni unajua uja, u, una u, u, mawazo yako yani unatakiwa yani just huna shida yani no, um, watu hawaelewi vizuri kwamba wait hichi ni kitu ambacho ni cha kweli hichi ni kitu ambacho kina, kinasumbua hichi ni kitu ambacho kinaweza kukusababisha wewe u, uchukue maisha yako um, and that's hiyo ni, 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 ni mfano mmoja tu lakini um, uh, kitu kingine ni kwamba uh, watu ambao wana, wana, wana magonjwa ya kiakili so sio sio sana sana labda depression na vitu ambavyo tunaweza tukuishi tukaendelea vyo katika community right kwa sababu kuna wengine ambao wana, wana magonjwa ya kiakili ambayo ni yanawazuia kabisa kufanya kuishi kuishi maisha ya kawaida um, na hao ambao wanapitia wana, wana hayo mambo wanakuwa wanaweka wanakuwa wana, wana wana stigmatized alafu wanakuwa wanatengwa kwa sababu hamna mtu anajua jinsi ya kukaa nao jinsi ya kuwatunza ndio tunajua unajua watu naishia kwenye 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 um, nini uh, mental institu- mental health institutions ambazo ziko kule nyumbani ambazo zinakuwa hazina hazina mfumo mzuri ambao unaweza kweli kuwapa msaada ambao wanahitaji so um, na ningependa kuendelea kuongea zaidi kuhusu haya lakini najua wakati tunapozidi kuongea wakati tunapoingia kwenye hii panel ya pili panel ya tatu uh, ya domestic violence nadhani hivi vitu vitagusiwa vita pia um, lakini kwa sababu ya muda um, na inabidi ni, ni cut it short but um, nilikuwa nataka just ku, ku kuastizia na kuwa kwa shauri na kuwa kwa just encourage kwamba wakati tunapoishi sisi tunaishi huku nje um, ni muhimu sana kukumbuka kwamba nyumbani you know haya matatizo yapo tuna experience huku na sasa nyingine tunasema kwamba okay tuna, tunaleta tunaleta belief zetu na stigma zetu huku right kwamba okay um, watu hii sio kitu ambacho ni cha kiko serious sana sio kitu ambacho um, watu wanapitia au mimi napitia unajua unadharau you know um, lakini watu wana, watu wanateseka kuhusu wanateseka na, na mambo ya depression wanateseka na mambo ya uh, magonjwa ya kisaikolojia um, na wakati tuko huku huku nje ni muhimu kwamba tu tuelewe kwamba ni not just sisi wenyewe tunapitia na watu ambao tunatuzunguka lakini watoto wetu wanapitia pia um, unajua uh, 
kitu ambacho tunajifunza kwenye psychology ni kwamba um, mahitaji ya watu yanatofautiana yana, yana kadri yana, yana, yana kadri kadri mahitaji yanavyozidi kuti, kutimizwa kwa hiyo inaitwa Maslow's hierarchy of needs so that's just one format ambayo ina, inaeleza jinsi ambavyo mahitaji yetu yapo lakini moja ya mahitaji ambayo wanadamu tunahitaji tukishapata mahitaji yetu ya mwili ya kimwili chakula nyumba mavazi um, you, you know protection um, ni ni mahitaji ya kisaikolojia which is ni self esteem na, na mtu wa ku, watu kukupenda na kukusupport um, and so hayo mahitaji watu wote watakuja wanayapitia um, kwa hiyo ni muhimu kama sisi kama wazazi tunajua kwamba okay sisi tulitoka labda nyumbani tulikuwa hatuna vitu vitu ambavyo tunavivihitaji um, kwa hiyo tunahangaika sana hapa kuwapa watoto wetu kila kitu lakini hatu hatukai nao hatuwapi muda hatuongei nao hatuwaulize shule iko vipi wanaendeleaje hatuchukuli hatu, hatu umuhimu mahitaji yao ya kisaikolojia na ndio hapo hapo sasa ambapo mara nyingi sisi kama uh, generation uh, generation ya kwanza inaweza kuja kupotea kiraisi kwa sababu tunawaacha katika mazingira ambayo hawatunzwi hawa na mazingira ambayo kisaikolojia wanapata msaada kutoka kwa watu wengine kutoka kacha zingine kwa hiyo wanapoteza yale maadili ambayo sisi kama jamii ambayo na wazazi unataka sana watoto wako wawe na mna fulani lakini umewalea huku na kwa sababu hukuchukua muda ku, labda kuwajaza vitu ambavyo na kuwa kuwa, 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 kuwa kuwa nao kwa karibu wanapoteza uh, yale maadili wanapoteza ule u, ile direction ambayo mngependa watoto wako wawe nayo lakini kwa well, that's just a few things ambazo nilikuwa nataka kusema um, najua tumeishia na muda lakini just wanted to kuwa kuwaeleza na kuwa encourage na kuambia kwamba um, ni jambo ambalo ni la muhimu na kama humjachukua muda kusoma na kulitafanyia kuli 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 utafiti lifanyeni utafiti if anything kwa niaba ya watoto wenu um, na generation ya watoto ambao tunawakuza huko Marekani ambao wanakuza wanalelea huko nje nashukuruni sana Welcome to Society of America Questions and Answers uh, thank you so much uh, for the presentation in terms of understanding the Swahili culture and the values that we have instilled in our communities and how we can maintain those good cultures and also how we can uh, you know, educate other people about the Swahili culture. So my question is for Dr. Mwaka. You mentioned that there's a lot of people who are learning the Swahili language and there's resources available. Um, can you speak more in terms of the education component, those who are wanting to, interested in going to college, pursuing their bachelor's degree or their master's degree? Are there federal resources or um, in-campus resources that are available for those who want to take those courses? And what does that look like? So, uh, thank you for that great question. Yes, as I said, we have resources available. Uh, all institutions uh, that offer Swahili will admit students uh, sometimes at zero level, or they will, when they come in, we do what we call placement test, or proficiency uh, testing. In other words, we want to determine where is this person. Uh, for the students who are heritage learners, some of us do have children, and therefore they learn the language at home informally. But when they come, we do admit them, and they actually, we, are, we integrate them into the system in ways that they are able to follow and uh, you know, work on their undeveloped language skills. Now, the universities, especially if they have a grant, I'll speak for example, we have a grant at Howard University from the federal government department of education. We normally get what we call FLAS, foreign language area studies. Now these are not only at Howard, there are several, I mean many institutions uh, nationwide. A student who comes in can get what we call a fellowship, the FLAS fellowship. Uh, for the summer, they get 7,500, and they can go to East Africa, study Swahili. Uh, and so some of us who have study abroad programs, we do take those students. Uh, we also have the academic year, which means you will get um, 10,000 for tuition, it goes towards your tuition, and you get, uh, I think, 5,000 that goes to you as stipend. Now, a student can get that in addition to whatever uh, um, other scholarship they have or tuition waiver, whatever they have. We don't look at that and say, oh, you're not going to get this. So what I'm saying is if our students are able to come in and say, I want to study Swahili, and I want to actually go all the way to minor, 
that student could potentially get that kind of funding. Let me give you an example also just using Howard. Just last week, we were able to award uh, uh, how many scholarships, uh, fellowships, about, about 12 for the academic year, okay? Uh, but not just for Swahili, of course, there were other languages, but Swahili has always dominated because we have more students applying for those. For the study abroad, there were 60-something students who applied uh, from Howard to go to study abroad. We were able to give uh, how many? About 12 to study abroad. We are not the only ones. There are others who are doing that. I mentioned earlier on about Fulbright. Fulbright is a nationwide competition. Any student who wants to study Swahili at the advanced level can apply. How many applications did we get? We got 49 applications across the nation to study Swahili alone. How many uh, scholarships do we have? We have 15. So we have kind of uh, narrowed that uh, pool to 15. And we have, of course, alternate those who are going to study. So. Uh, if somebody drops out, they're going to be considered. So there are so many scholarships. And um, uh, what our students can do, including other places, the reason why some of us are here is we were able to get a scholarship to teach Swahili while we studied what it is that we were doing. So there are those centers of African studies, for example, University of Florida, uh, Indiana University, um, Harvard, uh, of course, Howard has um, you know, a graduate program, and we do help one of our students, actually, who is doing her PhD. She is teaching for us because she can get that funding as well. You go to Yale, you go to Boston, all of these institutions will have that. So I just want to encourage you, as you look at the possible offerings at each institution your child is planning to go to, even you, as a, you know, if you want to extend your education, education has no limit in terms of age. Uh, please consider that, and uh, we will certainly support you in that endeavor. You know, actually, I'm actually a recipient of class. I oh, was nice. at Cornell University, mm -hmm. and I was awarded a class to study Nepali. Mm -hmm. I, since I spoke Swahili, I, would, I, was, I couldn't quite qualify for the class. Uh -huh. So I entered into uh, Cornell and was able to take the class, mm -hmm. uh, qualified it for the summer and a full graduate year. Mm -hmm. So at Cornell, uh, just like you were saying, they paid for me to learn Nepali during the summer. They paid for me to learn Swahili, and also they paid for it, uh, for me to um, to learn Swahili, to learn Nepali during the academic year. And I was awarded a, a fellowship to go through my graduate program, but the flask covered everything else, mm -hmm. meaning it covered my tuition and my stipend. So I'm glad that FLAS is being offered for the Swahili language because that means that, you know, people can, you can't, you, you have no reason to tell me that you can't learn the language. There's federal resources that are out there and Dr. Mwaka has highlighted that. So this is great to hear. Yeah. 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 Let me just what, I mean, add one thing. Uh, some of our students who have come to us, they want to be doctors and then uh, some of them have had to go with them to East Africa, Tanzania, and then Kenya. You know, what it does, it changes the trajectory. When they see the real situation, they say, I'm changing how I'm going to do my stuff because I see a need here. So this is where, even though they have moved away and maybe they were born here or raised for the most part here, they see the need back in Africa and say, we are going to provide our services there. So because they're now informed, so I think it really helps in terms of career options. We are going to get more people who are well-educated and who are willing to really focus on helping our communities. Um, I think you also know about the, um, the, the army, people who go to the, you know, the army. Sometimes, if they have an, a foreign language, they actually, not up sometimes, they do get more money. So that is important for you to know. And some of my students actually took Swahili with that intention. Mm -hmm. And now they are hired, they live a good life, sure. they meet their needs, oh. they are educated. So I think we want to just say language is a powerful resource sure. that we should all not overlook and think, ah, who needs Swahili? No, we all need Swahili, they need Swahili, we need, all of us need Swahili in, in a way. So Absolutely. thank you for mentioning that.
so the the panel was very informative. I appreciate the diverse range of the topic um, in terms of the Kiswahili language. Um, my question is specifically, considering the statistics that specific Dr. Marker you gave us concerning the institutions that are implementing teaching Kiswahili and just the amount of people in general around the world um, speaking Kiswahili outside of East Africa where it's originated, how come, at least in my option of what I've seen, how come it's not being translated in terms of career options? It's not being as pushed forward when it comes to learning French or being able to speak Arabic or things like that because people I feel like um, prioritize your Spanish or your French because you feel like you're reaching out more people, but I feel like they're not really looking into Kiswahili language. I feel like it's being underestimated or belittled in a sense. So what ways could employers or um, other institutions push forward using that language when it comes to different career options outside of just linguistics? Yes. Let me put it this way. Thank you so much for that. Again, it is our government, it is us, to make sure that we make this clear that Swahili is an important language. I'll tell you one thing, and I'm sure some of you know, if you come to this country, if you haven't, even though you'll say, I come from Kenya, or we speak English, you have to come here, they'll tell you, take this exam. The TOEFL exam, most of you have done that. Uh, and, 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 and of course, those who went to graduate school know that we have to do GRE. And most of what is contained there, as uh, Professor Boas was saying, you'll see that it carries a culture of those countries or those, you know, that the community where you're going to. We need to do the same for Swahili. Uh, and, and we have been proposing this uh, in ways that would help us to be able to say, okay, if you want to work in East Africa, you need to know Swahili. And that is the thing. The State Department or the USAID says you have to qualify in this language if you're going to that side. Yeah. So you have to train. I've seen people train. I've helped them, some of them, to be able to do that. We need to foster this and think, I mean, make this a requirement. Um, I didn't mention that, of course, I do. Uh, I'm a member of uh, what we call Chaukidu, Chama Chaukuzaju Kiswahili Duniani. I'm the president of that. And what we're trying to do is really to work with governments in East Africa, embassies, and make sure that they do understand we are an important um, uh, element in terms of whatever we're doing. So your question is valid and it's high time, uh, for example, uh, Swahili Society America, we need to work together to make sure that when people are saying now we're going to this particular part of the country or the world, we say one of the requirements is Swahili. Why not? And if they want to come and, and study, for example, at our institutions, we have to make it a priority and say you have to pass this exam before you can be admitted into this. And this is just the right thing to do. Swahili is not just another language. It's a very important language because if you cannot communicate, if we don't have a common language here, there's no way we're going to communicate. I'll give you my example. I went to Mexico the first uh, one week. I had a headache because I couldn't speak Spanish. Uh, yeah, so for the one and a half years I lived in Mexico, I became very fluent because I realized it was important. And no one would actually tell me anything other than speaking Spanish. They would smile at me if I didn't know what they were saying, but they wouldn't help me. That is how we should look at language and say, it is, anybody can learn a language. We are, um, as you know, human beings, we have that capacity to learn any language. Even though sometimes we say we have what we call um, the critical age, which is about 12 years old. But beyond that, you can learn the language. The only thing you may not be able to overcome is an accent, but everybody has an accent. So yeah, yeah. don't feel shy exactly. about these things. Just yeah. learn language, it will come. That is how I would say it. So again, we'll make it a requirement, and we just have to work with policymakers. Uh, we are working with Akalan. Akalan is Academy of uh, African Languages. We're working, of course, uh, because it's an U um, African Union kind of arm that looks at language and culture. So all governments have subscribed to that. And we do represent you know, the diaspora in ways of saying, listen, this is important. Don't, do not overlook these languages that we have. And so Swahili is actually one of them. Just the other day, they met in uh, Paris uh, to recognize Swahili as a critical language and as a language of wider communication. So a lot is going on, and I think we just need to put everything together. Yeah. I would like to have two questions. My name is Amin. I'm from Seattle, Washington. One question for you, madam. You talk about behavior and mental issues. It's just remind me, back in Tanzania, we have an issue about mental issues. 
Um, the last three years ago, I think is one of the journalists from ABC went to Tanzania to talk about albinos. And government of Canada intervened that issues about killing albinos or and other elderly people. So what we can do to educate people to eradicate this problem of mental issues of killing maybe albinos or elderly people in Tanzania. That's and how we can associate these issues from here and there to make sure people are aware that mental issues is not a killing. Question number two is for Mr. Professor. I just echo one point. Uh, when I was in Tanzania, particularly in Zanzibar many years ago, before I migrated to the U.S., I had initiated one program with the University of Ilham, Indiana, to bring students from America to Tanzania study Institute of Kiswahili and Foreign Languages. My question to you is, how at university do they have the similar program to take students to learn Swahili language and then also associate with culture? As you said, Swahili is culture as well. But I remember very well when I was in Zanzibar, I initiated that program and extended all over to Bagamoyo with a Professor Brent, Professor Nancy Taylor, and I hope you know Mrs. Aluia from University of Indiana. He conducting a program for Kiswahili. And it was very successful. But question to you, how our university does have that programs and how is implemented? Thank you. Thank you so much um, for your question. Um, Mimi Namini Kwamba um, katika tatizo, matatizo yote ambayo tunapata katika jamii uh, jambo la kwanza ambalo linaweza kutusaidia kuondokana na hilo tatizo ni elimu um, na tumeona kihistoria um, Tanzania uh, jinsi ambavyo kipindi wakati wagonjwa um, for example ugonjwa wa ukimu ulivyokuwa umeingia um, sana umetapakaa ume, ume sana watu walikuwa hawana elimu juu ya ugonjwa walikuwa wana wana wanawatenga wana, wana watu ambao wanaumwa wanawatendea wana, 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 wana vitu ambavyo sio 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 vizuri kwa sababu wamepata wame ugonjwa kwa sababu hawana elimu na lakini tumeona miaka inavyozidi kwenda jinsi ambavyo watu wanavyozidi kupata elimu wanavyozidi kuelewa uh, ugonjwa unahusikana na nini unavotibiwa na unavyoambukizwa watu wakaanza kuelewa kwamba ah kumbe tunaweza kuendelea kuishi na wenzetu katika jamii zetu wanaendelea kufanya kazi wanaendelea kuishi maisha yao kurudi shuleni kujijenga kimaisha um, bila kuona kwamba kwa sababu wameambukizwa virusi basi maisha yao yameisha kwa hiyo mimi nadhani na, na imani kwamba inaanza kwenye 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 ilo, kwenye inaanza kwenye elimu sisi kuwe ku, 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 kwa elimisha wenzetu, kwa elimisha jamii zetu kuhusu ukweli wa haya mambo, kuhusu albino, kuhusu um, wazee wana, wanapitia mambo gani wa, as, as, as geriatric uh, 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 individuals watu ambao ni wako wako kwenye kwenye wamefikia wame umri fulani, wanapitia matatizo gani, wanapitia mambo gani wa, wa, um, kisaikolojia, kiafya ambayo sisi mara nyingi watu ambao tuko umri wadogo ama tuko umri wa kati hatuwezi kuelewa kwa sababu hatuja fika huko. Kwa hiyo mimi na imani kwamba um, inaanza kwetu sisi kama kama watu ambao for example sasa kama wewe umelisaje hilo jambo which means kwamba ni kitu ambacho ni cha muhimu kwako au kimekugusa na na nadhani katika yote hayo whether ni ugonjwa wa ukimwi ama ni ni mambo ya ya ya, ya, ya kisaikolojia uh, magonjwa ya kisaikolojia ni watu ambao wana wameguswa na hilo jambo kufanya kitu juu yake. Mimi binafsi uh, naamini uh, kwamba you know again 
kulizungumzia jambo kufanya utafiti kwenda kusoma na kama nilivyo nilivyowashauri hapa kwenda kusoma kuhusu ilo jambo kuelewa okay kinachoendelea ni nini kwa sababu tunaishi kwenye dunia ambayo tuna tuna tuna, tuna information tuna uh, vitu kila kitu kiko hapa mbele yetu tunatafuta unaingia google unapata kila kitu unachohitaji um, as far as kuelewa somo somo fulani um, na, na kwa hiyo sisi ni jukumu letu sisi kuchukua uh, somo lolote au kitu chochote ambacho tunaona ni cha kwetu especially kama sisi ambao tunaishi huku nje kulipeleka nyumbani na kuf, ku, kufanya kitu juu yake um, ni, ni moja wa hiyo kitu ambacho tunafanya ni, ni for example ni project ambayo mimi na rafiki yangu nafanya actually yuko hapa leo um, ambao tume tunakuja pamoja kutengeneza podcast ambayo itaongelea mambo ya ya ya, ya, ya kisaikolojia na tunatumai kwamba hiyo hiyo tutaweza kuja kui, 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 kui sambaza, nyumbani kusambaza katika jamii zetu ili kuweza kuzungumzia haya mambo ambayo sisi tuna tunapitia ambayo watu uh, wa Marekani hawezi kutuelewa kwa sababu hawa hawajatoka Tanzania kuja hapa kuelewa kitu tunachokipitia na watu wa nyumbani unfortunately pia hawezi kutuelewa um, kwa hiyo sisi kama wat, wa Tanzania tunajua tunachokipitia tunajua haya mambo tunayopitia kwa hiyo kila mmoja aki, akisema anachukua anafanya sehemu yake anawaelimisha watu ambao wamezunguka ina, ina, ndo ina, inabadilisha mambo ndo, 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 ndivo dunia inavyobadilika that's what nambo tunaweza kushauri na kusema yeah. Yeah. asante sana kwa swali lako ambalo ni zuri kuhusu programu za Kiswahili uh, Tanzania au tuseme hata Zanzibar uh, kwa hivyo tuna program nzuri sana uh, chuo kikuu cha Hawa tangu mwaka 2006 kimekuwa kikiwapeleka wanafunzi Afrika Mashariki na palikuwepo pia na mkataba na chuo kikuu cha Suza uh, Zanzibar ambapo serikali ilikuwa imetoa hela uh, uh, kesi kikubwa tu kwa hivyo wanafunzi walikuwa nakwenda kule wanaishi kule kwa zaidi ya muhula mmoja na bado kuna hayo masomo yanaendelea ila sasa sio serikali inayodhamini hayo masomo lakini sasa ni wanafunzi wenyewe na chuo pia kina Uh, gharamia baadhi ya uh, uh, zile um, gharama za huko uh, so in very so that everybody gets what i'm saying is that we do have a very good uh, summer program study abroad which is six weeks it goes to tanzania and kenya so they will be in tanzania for four weeks and they'll be in kenya for two weeks uh, this uh, this year for example hopefully everything goes on well Uh, we already have people who have applied and the students leave on the 31st of May and they come back on the uh, 12th of July. What this means is that those are six weeks and anybody can apply to be a part of this program. You can come in as a student at large or a visiting student during the summer. You don't have to be a Howard student. All you need to do is to have that interest which allows you to really get the language going. So if you think, oh, what is my child going to do during the summer? Hey, talk to me. And we're going to be able to give them a chance to be a part of the program. Whatever level, zero level, we'll give them the language. When they come back, they have six credits. In other words, they can, it can work towards their language requirement in college, and it can also help them. And it's both linguistic and cultural um, kind of immersion. So wonderfully put. We have a wonderful program. Uh, Dr. Aluya Omar is somebody we work with. Uh, we work with Souza, we work with uh, Dar es Salaam, we work with Pwani University in Kenya, and all of these institutions just to make sure that our students are well equipped to know this language, not only by grammar, but also the nuances that come in because of knowing the culture of the people. Asanteni sana kwa maelezo yenu um, na swali kuhusu ukuaji wa Kiswahili kwa sababu hapa kama tulivyo Marekani tunasoma Kiingereza na tuna cultural tofauti na Marekani na, na Tanzania kwa hiyo nilikuwa nawaza how do we are there some things that we can pick up from American is it allowed is it restricted is it okay to blend the two sando kutoka kama hivyo ngwa sijaelewa tunaruhusiwa ama turuhusiwa ama inategemea na familia na ukuaji wa Kiswahili na kuaje si kama to anybody <laughs> Asante kwa swali hilo nafikiri hata pengine wengi wana fikiria kama wanavyofikiria lakini nafikiri tuna freedom jamani eh yeah tuna freedom kwa hiyo ile freedom tunaitumia we use that freedom to investigate 
to learn. There are no limits as long as you are within the law. Mladi kwa katika sheria basi unatumia uhuru wako. Kwa kujifunza ni muhimu hapa. So so hakuna sheria kwamba wewe unataka ku interact na Wamarekani vizuri then lazima ujue angala udini nani mila zao culture zao you have to learn about their culture ili wewe sasa ukaanza ku interact pale unakuwa effect kwa sasa usijua yeah na wewe huku wanao na wewe ni waswahili mnakutana mnazungumza then you get a clear understanding then you can deal with them effectively hapa kwa hiyo kujua wao na wao kama wanatumia pesa kukufahamu wewe basi interaction ile inakuwa inaboreka yale mawasiliano yanakuwa na maana zaidi kwa sababu tayari mna listen skills unaelewa value zao, zao kwamba utakuwa offend na wao hawataka kuoffend wewe then you can, you can move on in doing business or socialization whatever you doing so i think knowing one another is a key to development kitu muhimu ambacho mimi nafikiri pia unapaswa kuelewa ni utambulisho kwamba uh, ikiwa umekuja kuishi jamii ya watu ni muhimu sana uelewe la sivyo utaishi hapa kwa kusononeka uh, kwa hivyo lazima ukubali kwamba uko kwa wenyewe uh, kuna wengi wamesema tunarudi nyumbani sasa ni labda muongo mmoja <laughs> kwa hivyo ni vizuri uishi kwa namna hiyo lakini usivibeze vya kwako kwa sababu ukifanya hivyo basi unakuwa hauna ule utambulisho wako kumbuka kwamba utambulisho hubadilika ulipo lakini chukua vizuri vile ambavyo vipo huku na vile vizuri vya kwako vihifadhi yeah. vile ambavyo unaona vinakuja kuleta mkinzano jaribu ku kutumia sasa busara hapo yeah, ndio hivyo tu